I, this is fun. I'm Bob Willie. This is I, I've had to do this several times in a row now. Where I, I, you have to introduce the introducer more than the introduced, is the way I put it. Uh, it's really great to have Ben with us today to be able to share on bees and beekeeping in the Low Country. Um, you got the background a little bit of who he is and what he's been doing. Uh, graduate of Wofford College for undergraduate degree, Clemson University for his master's degree. And um, how long have you been with uh, the program then? Well, um, at, at I've been with Clemson University as an employee for, gosh, 14 years now, but very I good. have been the apiculture specialist for just over two. Very good. Very, very good. And this is a part of our, um, a lot of you are regulars with us, which is wonderful, but others are guests with us today, and I hope it makes it a re become a regular, but it's a part of our Tuesdays With series, which is a monthly lecture series that goes from September through May. Uh, Tuesdays With comes from the title of a book came out in 1997 by Mitch Albin called Tuesdays with Maury. And we chose that title because it's a wonderful book about the ongoing relationship between a college student and a professor that continued way beyond his college years. And uh, that's exactly what our program is all about, the continuing education and learning that all of us need to be involved with as we continue through our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, that's up to me, 80s, 90s, and others. Uh, to be able to continue in life to be learning. And so today we learn about bees, and we're very glad to have Ben with us today. So yeah. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so just to add to the, the introduction, um, my name is Ben Powell. I work with Clemson University, and uh, my position is the coordinator of the apiculture and pollinator program. So the program essentially focuses on two areas, uh, helping the beekeeping industry and beekeepers get better and stronger in South Carolina, and then also working with the general public on a, awareness issues related to pollinators. Um, there has been some relatively bad news uh, as it relates to bees and, and pollinators over the past couple decades, and uh, it is in the vested interest of every citizen to protect pollinators and honeybees um, because of the services they provide, both in agriculture and for our ecosystems. Um, so. What I do is a, a public programs like this. We do trainings for beekeepers. I work with the State Beekeepers Association and the nearly two dozen local beekeeper associations around the state um, to help beekeepers become better beekeepers. And uh, um, what we're going to do today is we're just going to discuss what it takes to become a beekeeper. Um, I know that there's a few of you that are experienced in the office in the in the room, and I, some of what we're going to talk you you know of this stuff. You've, you have experienced this. So um, please be patient with me as I address the folks that don't have any background in bees. And then we'll try to save some time at the end to actually uh, talk about bees and beekeeping. And, and for those of you that have bees, that'd be a great time to you know, address some of the concerns and issues. Uh, we will mention some of the problems that bees have and some concerns that you need to address. And uh, maybe that'll spawn a few questions as we get there. Um, all right, well, let's get started then. So we're just going to talk about what apiculture is and what it takes to get into beekeeping uh, and uh, maybe point you to some resources to help you further your learning and, uh, and your success. So uh, apiculture is an agricultural practice. It is very similar to livestock management. Um, instead of keeping vertebrates like horses and goats and sheep and pigs, um, we're keeping invertebrates, and uh, the in primary invertebrate that is cultivated is the, uh, the western honeybee. Now, the western honeybee is oftentimes called the European honeybee, and that's because its native range is Europe, Africa, and the western uh, Asia area. Um, and we have cultivated that insect because it is a very strong mutualist species with us. And what I mean by that is the, we benefit from honeybees. We get tangible goods. We use honeybees to pollinate our crops. Uh, we actually use bees for scientific endeavors and study. And uh, they, they are large, no, arguably, other than humans, they are the best studied organism on this planet. We know as much about bees, honeybees, as we do about humans, and we still don't know everything. Um, and we've been researching honeybees for thousands of years, uh, and, and 
it is a fascinating field to get into. Whether or not you're just somebody interested in tending to a colony of bees or actually somebody who's using science to teach at a university like that. Um, so let me make a few distinctions here real quick. Um, apiculture is a practice of keeping bees, but the actual study of bees is apicology. So if you do the Greek derivation, api or apis is the Greek term for bee. And then ology is the study of. So apicology is study of bees. And that is not just honeybees. In fact, in North America, we have six different families of bees, and that constitutes nearly 4,000 species of insects, uh, all of which are unique because they are different from almost all other insects on the planet in that their primary food source is pollen. That's where they get their protein. That's how they generate the food necessary to raise their young. And so they intentionally go to flowers to collect pollen and, and nectar, but the pollen is the food source, which means that bees are the absolute most important and most efficient pollinators. Also, many of these bees uh, that are in these families here, they're specialists. They are a small species that maybe lives in a very isolated area and feeds only on one tiny group of plants. And it may be the only pollinator for that group of plants. So these 4,000 plus, or almost 4,000 species of bees are responsible for maintaining such diversity in our plant communities around us. In fact, the plants that we see around us that have all the big showy flowers, the colors, the shapes, the smells, the designs of those flowers, that diversity of plants is largely driven by the diversity of the insects that visit them. So when we talk about beekeeping, we're not just talking about Western honeybees. We're actually talking about a lot of different bees um, in the study of. But these bees, like I mentioned, they're a little bit different from their kin. Um, Y'all know what group the bees belong to in the insects? Well, it's called the Hymenoptera. I don't think I have it over here. But if we were our basal group right here, we would call this the Hymenoptera, which are the ants, bees, and wasps. And y'all know wasps, right? Wasps can sting, bees can sting, ants can sting. Um, that is a large group of the ants, bees, and wasps. And look at how many different families we have in this order. And each of those families may contain hundreds or thousands of species. So there's tremendous diversity within this group. But the bees are special. Because if you look at most of these families, actually these wasps, they feed on other insects or protein. They're foods, they're predators or parasites. They actually eat other insects or feed other insects to their young to provide the protein. But this one branch broke away and basically went vegan. And instead of eating other insects, they went to plants and flowers to collect pollen for their food. Um, and so this group here we refer to as the true bees. And the true bees we can tell from all of the other hymenoptera because they have these really cool little hairs or seedy on their bodies. They're plumose or branched seedy. Why would bees need to be fuzzy? Well, right. And so actually they're collecting the pollen. And the best way to collect pollen is with a dust brush, right? You guys do it at home. Well, that's what they are. They are a Swiffer sheet. Um, and uh, they, in, while they're in flight, all of the bees actually generate a static electric charge. And so when they land on a flower, the pollen grains actually, like magnets, stick to their bodies and all these, these hairs. And then the bees use, they groom themselves, and they collect that pollen into some sort of basket or carrying device. In the case of Western honeybees, they stick it to their legs. They have these pollen baskets on their legs. In the case of a lot of other bees, they, it's under their belly or on their sides or on all of their legs. Um, so it, all of the bees eat pollen and have these special hairs that, oh gracious, come on now. There we go. Could push it a little harder. Um, they have these special hairs to help them collect pollen. Now, apiculture is the practice of managing and keeping bees. And a lot of these bees are not easily managed. You know, these bees that I'm talking about, these little ground bees that we see, 
they live by themselves, they have a very specific habitat need, like they, they burrow into the soil, make little chambers, they live their lives by themselves, and that's a really difficult insect to manage. But there are a few groups of bees that actually can be kept, managed, and moved around for a variety of, of reasons. Um, these include the western honeybee, they include also bumblebees, we do keep bumblebees for pollination services. We also manage some of the uh, cavity nesting bees or mason bees, resin bees. Y'all have maybe seen the little houses with the holes drilled in them or tubes. Yeah, so we can actually keep orchard bees and mason bees for pollination services. But usually when we say apiculture, we're talking about the western honeybee because the western honeybee is unique in that it creates perennial colonies that have thousands or tens of thousands of individuals in the colony. And we can build housing for those bees and manage those bees to produce the goods, move them to crops to pollinate, migrate around the country um, to service agriculture, and, uh, and then also you know, produce all these tangible goods. The western honeybee is unique in that it is a social insect. And that means that it creates a colony that has division of labor. And what I mean by that is that there is a specific queen. And the queen is responsible for maintaining the population. She produces the baby bees. There are workers. The workers are the ones who do all of the tasks in the colony, collecting food, tending to br the brood and the babies. Uh, and then there are drones. And the drones just are lazy, sitting around drinking beer and watching football, basically. Um, but they're there to service the queen and, and make sure that the genetic material that's necessary to maintain the population gets transferred to the queen. So this social aspect means that they, they, it's like a super organism. Each colony is like one animal, and that animal goes out into the world around it to collect food and build the nest and, and supply the colony with its needs. Um, that colony lasts all the way through the year. Most of our bees, even the other social bees and wasps, they, the colony dies at the end of the year. So think about yellow jackets, right? Yellow jackets are a social insect. They have large colonies, a lot like bees do. But at the end of the year, when the first frosts come, what the colony does is it produces a bunch of queens, and all the workers and drones that were produced the, from that year die. Those queens disperse, find a hiding place, and then next spring when it warms up, those queens start a whole new colony. So every year that colony has to start from scratch. Not with honeybees. Honeybees stay as a large colony all the way through the winter because they have some cool adaptations, like they can generate heat, they can keep themselves warm, they can raise brood even when it's 32 degrees outside. It's pretty amazing what honeybees are, are capable of doing. Uh, and then, of course, to maintain that big colony with tens of thousands of individuals, they've got to produce a lot of food or collect a lot of food, which means that honeybees are hoarders by nature. And that means they produce more food than the colony needs, and that extra food we can rob. That's where we get our honey and other resources that we take from honeybees. That's why I got to point it back there. We go. Um, in agriculture, honeybees are exceptionally important. And the reason is they provide pollination services from, for some of the, the, the better foods. You know, we as humans over the past few hundred years have been much more successful in producing babies, growing larger, being more healthy and productive. And it's largely due to the fact that we have a diet that is very diverse. We can eat a lot of different things and we get a lot of nutrition from a lot of different plants. Those plants could not be cultivated if it were not for honeybees. Many of the fun foods, things like watermelons and almonds and uh, apples and, you know, a lot of the foods that make our diet diverse and enjoyable can be attributed to honeybee pollination. That means that honeybees are actually responsible for about $20 billion worth of crop value every single year. Um, some of these crops, such as almonds, cherries, and blueberries, are almost entirely pollinated by honeybees. 
Uh, so were honeybees not here, those crops would not exist. Uh, and then honeybees also produce honey that we collect, and that value hovers around $300 million each year. Uh, we as North America are the largest consumer of honey in the world, and we, have to, we don't have enough bees to supply our honey demand. So we net import honey from other parts of the world. When you go to the grocery store and pick up a bottle of honey, look on the label at where it was bottled. Half of the time the grocery store was bottled in China, Asia, Europe, South America. Um, this is why it's so important to support your local beekeepers. It's better honey. You can guarantee it's honey. You're not diluted with some other sugar or something else. Um, and you're supporting not only your local beekeeper, but local agriculture as well. <clears throat> as I mentioned, some crops absolutely have to have honeybees, like almonds. There's about 1.5 million acres of uh, almonds in California, which is the world's largest producer. Each acre has to have two colonies of honeybees to pollinate it, which means it requires 3 million honeybee colonies to pollinate the almond crop, and there's only about 3 million honeybee colonies in the United States. So almost all of the honeybees in the United States go to California to pollinate. Now, they don't have to be there all at one time. Almonds are actually uh, produced all the way up and down California. So there are different almond blooms happening. So there's not three million bees over in California at any given time. There might be a million. And those million migrate from Southern California up. And then when the almonds are done, they go up into Washington State and hit the cherries. And when the cherries are done, they come over into the Dakotas and do sunflowers. Uh, and then some of them stay in like Michigan and Maine and places like that to do blueberries. And, uh, and so this, this migration, migrating pollination is one of the most, uh, most important economic um, incentives for beekeepers. Now, you can keep bees locally, small scale, and be very productive and, and actually make a living at it. But our large commercial beekeepers, the ones who maintain thousands of colonies, they are migratory in, by nature. They are following crop blooms around the nation. In trucks? In trucks. They load a flatbed trailer with 400 colonies each, stacked three high, and, uh, and they truck them out there. And every now and then a wreck happens. And it, oh yeah, it's a mess. Um, and it's all hands on deck and beekeepers from the county will usually get called to come out and help corral the bees. Um, I, there's a fun story about a wreck that happened on I-10 in Texas and it took a hundred beekeepers to get all of those bees back in the boxes and reloaded and uh, sent on out to California. Um, yeah, it's something else. And these guys work hard. The beekeepers that do this stuff, they work basically 36 to 48 hours straight loading trucks because the bees can't stay on the truck forever. They only be on there for a couple days. And those trucks actually um, are given some leniency in trucking rules so that they can travel further before they have to stop. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Now, in South Carolina, we don't have a lot of these major um, agricultural crops that require honeybees, but we do have to have some of our crops serviced, and that's primarily blueberries and our cucurbits, uh, things like squash, watermelons, cucumbers, um, pumpkins. Uh, so we do have some commercial pollination going on in South Carolina, and if you were to become a beekeeper, you could get paid to actually move bees to these crops to pollinate those, serv uh, those crops. Um, a few people might get the, the pleasure of moving all the way to the upstate and doing apples. Um, unfortunately, apples just don't do well in most of South Carolina. Uh, and then a lot of these other crops that are emerging, believe it or not, like canola, is actually a possible um, pollination service for those of us that live down here in the, in the PD region. Okay. So bees have a long history with humans, um, not just because of agriculture, but because they, they actually have a cultural root with humans. You know, thousands of years ago, we were just like other animals, robbing bees in their wild colonies. Um, and there's images on, painted on cave walls of humans using smoke, going into bee colonies to rob them of their resources. Um, early civilizations saw the value of bees. In fact, 
For many areas, honey was the only sugar source, like Northern Europe. Um, there's a reason why the, the Vikings are known for their mead. Well, that was the only sugar source available to make the alcohol that they um, drank so heartily. Um, if you move down into Europe, you get down around the Mediterranean where they can grow things like grapes, right? Or you go down into Africa, they can grow things like sugar cane and other um, sugar. But in certain parts of the world, especially higher in the um, temperate regions, honey was the only sugar. So honey and mead and then the beeswax that the bees produce all were very critical to survival of these communities, especially in higher temperate zones. Um, and uh, beeswax is a really interesting compound in that the wax is, you can actually eat it and digest it. And when it burns, it burns completely clean. So you don't have dripping candles. It was the preferred candle for the Catholic Church because they could keep the churches lit with candles and worship services without having drippy stuff all over the place. I wish we would do it at our Christmas services. But because you know what happens whenever he shows up with the little candle or the little cup on it, it ends up dripping somewhere. Yeah. Beeswax wouldn't do that. Um, and you see this recorded in history, um, all the way back to the Egyptians, early Greeks, early Catholic Church. In fact, I love this. I got to visit Rome a couple times, and the, uh, the altar that is, o or the, the, what they call the Baldacchino that's over the altar in St. Peter's Basilica, the home of the Catholic Church, is adorned with these tiny, oh, you can't see it, but on the posts here, there are bees all up and down the posts because it was commissioned by Pope Julius IV, who was known as the Bee Pope. And he kept bees in the gardens around the church, as most Catholic churches did, for the sugar and for the, um, the beeswax. And they understood the value of the honeybee so much that it has been a central part of the Catholic church. In fact, y'all remember the Notre Dame burned a few years ago? The big story was, did the bees survive? And actually they did, believe it or not. So, you know, I, maybe the good Lord upstairs is looking out for, for other things too. Um, so apiculture, you know, historically was just us taking from bees. But over time, we learned that we could actually um, keep bees, not just rob them from their natural habitat, but actually provide homes for them. Homes that we could manage and, and actually expand bees and move bees. So. Uh, depending upon where you lived, you had different resources available to you. So if I was in Egypt or the Middle East where there's just not a lot of trees, is that Tim? Hey, come in all Mr. Incognito. Hey, Tim, how you doing? Um, yeah, so if you go um, into the Middle East and Egypt, there's not a lot of trees there. Bees were kept in clay pots, and so they would build these stacks of pots with a tiny little hole. They learned how they could split the colonies and actually in, put new colonies into these clay pots. If you lived in Europe, you had different resources like trees and straw and hay available to you. So this is where the uh, skep, the, um, the beehive that you see in all the pictures, right? The skep was a woven straw hive, um, and in um, Middle Europe or Upper Europe, you would have these things called gums, and that was basically a tree trunk that was hollowed out. Um, the one problem with these kinds of beehives, though, that was that it was once and done. When you started a colony in there, the colony would build out inside, and the only way to harvest the honey and the wax was to destroy the colony. Or you could remove the bees, but you, you had to destroy the comb and everything they had built to get to it. So it wasn't in a very manageable kind of way of keeping bees. You could, but it didn't give us an opportunity to actually go in and see how the bees were doing and, and monitor and manage them. And we definitely couldn't move them around very easily until, oh, go back. Um, so what happened about the time the Renaissance was going on was beekeepers were trying to figure out ways of making a hive that was portable, was manageable, that they could actually go in without destroying the comb um, and actually investigate and monitor the colony. Uh, so there was these needs to, to make bees easier to work with. And a bunch of different people tried to come up with designs. Um, 
They came up with these top bar hives where they basically laid bars across and let the bees draw the comb down off them. You could pick up the bars and see what was going on inside the hive. Um, if you got out into Eastern Europe, like Ukraine, Poland, Romania, they did these things called the Zirzon hives, or, or today they call them AZ hives. It was basically like a little library. You open the doors up and you could slide the frames out like this and investigate the bees. Wasn't really portable, but at least you could monitor what the bees were doing. Um, and then in Northern Europe, um, a gentleman named Huber came up with what he called the leaf hive. And it was kind of like a book. The frames opened up on hinges. So you could open the colony and actually see what was going on in the frames there. But eventually a gentleman who actually had origins in Europe but moved to North America developed what we refer to as the modern hive. His gentleman's name was Lorenzo Langstroth. And he used the designs and basically blended all the ideas from the other hives into one hive system that we call the modern day modular hive or the Langstroth hive. These are the hives you see when you're driving down the road. It's a series of boxes with very specific dimensions with removable frames that hold the comb. The boxes can be stacked and removed as needed. And then the boxes are also, since they're standard dimensions, can be moved among different colonies, which allowed us to actually blend and keep bees by using strong colonies to help weak colonies and, and use the equipment over and over and over again so that we weren't destroying the colony each time we, uh, we went in there. And the most important part of this is the comb that the bees draw, the honeycomb, requires a major investment of energy and time on the bees. It takes eight, gal or eight pounds of honey to produce one pound of wax, which means my bees have to consume a lot of sugar to make that wax. If I'm destroying the wax every time I'm going in, then I'm cutting into their ability to store honey and be productive. So this hive system allowed us to keep the wax comb intact for long periods of time so that the bees didn't have to keep redrawing it and you could be more productive and collect more honey. Um, we also learned thousands of years ago that bees um, are calmer when smoke is around. Actually what it is is just a natural adaptation to dealing with fire. You know, bees come from forested or prairie land habitats and so fire is common in their na native habitat. They adapted to when they sense smoke they learned they go down into the hive to gorge on the honey that's there because if fire is coming, they may have to abandon the hive. They need to take as much food with them as possible if they have to leave. So when you smoke a beehive, you're not calming the bees, you're just diverting their attention. You're getting them to focus on gorging on honey rather than defending the colony from a predator. So that's what smoking does. And now, we have a portable smoker. We call it a bellows smoker. We can get a little fire going in there and we can blow the bellows to actually puff smoke onto the bees in a very manageable way. Uh, and the bellows smoker is one of the most critical components of keeping bees calm and workable. We also have special tools in beekeeping. Um, and they're basically like your painter's tools and, and uh, uh, handyman tools. Uh, that you would you, you find at the hardware store. But they have to have a sharp edge because we've got to pry apart the boxes and we've got to separate the frames and loosen them so that we can move them. Um, and I'm going to show you in a second. Bees collect a lot of different things. They collect nectar, they produce wax, but they also collect resin from trees and they chew it into a paste we call bee gum or propolis. That propolis is used to glue everything together in that hive. And if we don't have a hive tool, we're not going to be able to separate the components so that we can actually open and manage the colony. Uh, there's a bunch of different designs. The one I like to use is this one here. Um, and uh, if you don't have a hive tool, you're not going to be able to manage your bee colonies. Inside of the hive, you have frames. And the frames are designed to house the comb. The problem is, bees don't read the same books we do. 
right? The bees will do whatever they want. <laughs> if you just stick frames in there, they're just going to draw them however. So what we do is we actually put in something we call foundation into those frames. Foundation is either made from wax or plastic, and it has the little imprints of the comb already started in it. So it gives them a template to grow on. And, and the foundation is placed inside the frame, and then the bees draw out the honeycomb cells off of that foundation. Without foundation, bees might actually draw across the frames so that when we go to remove the frames, we tear the comb all to pieces. Um, a few years ago, I got a call from, uh, actually, he used to be a county councilman here in Georgetown. Um, I think he's involved in real estate. They had picked up a property out Oh, gosh. Um, it was almost near Greeleyville. It was up there in that part of the county above uh, Andrews. And uh, the property was on foreclosure. And he said, Ben, there's a bunch of old beehive equipment out here. You're welcome to it if you want it. I was like, I'll come check it out. But I'm not too keen on picking up old used equipment. Why would that be? You might have pests and diseases associated with it. There might have been a reason those bees died in that equipment. And the last thing I want to do is put that into my apiaries. So I was like, I'll go check it out, but I'm not promising anything. Um, anything I don't take, you can just stack up and burn. Well, I get out there, and there, sure enough, a lot of these boxes are old and rotten. But there were two hives that were still standing, and bees were coming in and out of them. I was like, oh, cool. All right. Well, now I've got to be some bees. So I, it was late in the day. It was getting towards dark, and uh, the bee, I'd stacked those bees up, got them um, strapped together, put them on the back of the truck, and there was one more stack that had blown over or gotten knocked over. It was laying on the ground. I, I just went to check the equipment to see if it was any good. Sure enough, there were bees in that equipment laying down on the ground sideways, and the bees had totally redrawn all the comb to where the comb was in. It was going like this, not like this. So I was like, well, there's bees in there, and I don't want to just leave them here. So I tried. I tried to pull it all together. Funny thing was, though, I was coming back, and I had to go down through Andrews. It's nighttime. I've got this stack of bees. It's not supposed to be the way it is. And as I come around the corner right there at the main intersection in King's Tree, um, I feel the back of the truck shift, and that box had fallen over and gaped open and now thousands of bees are all clouding around my truck right in downtown King Street. Um, it's nighttime, but yeah, bees are not happy when they're open at night. So I was like, oh gosh, this is a bad thing. So I pulled over, got a, as much of it strapped together, duct taped as much as I could and got it in there. But the thing is, is bees are going to do what they're going to do if you don't provide the right kind of foundation and the template they need. So when you're, if you want to get into beekeeping, let me run back here real quick. Come on. Go. There you go. I'm going the other way. No, I'm pushing the other way. There, now all of a sudden it wants to work. Okay, um, so if you're going to get into beekeeping, this is the standard hive setup. You have some sort of bottom board or base, and, uh, and then above that we have what we call a deep box. The deep box is the brood chamber. That's where we want to keep the queen and the workers that are raising brood. We don't want brood where we're going to be putting honey because when we go to extract, we don't want a bunch of bee parts all in our honey, right? So we try to keep the queen and the, the brood in the bottom area. Sometimes we might stack multiple boxes down there, but at least the bottom of the hive is, is for the bees to raise new bees. Then we have something we call a queen excluder. It's large enough gaps to allow workers through, but too small for the queen to get through. So what the queen excluder does is it allows the workers that are full of nectar and honey to come up into the supers or the upper boxes to deposit the honey and food, but it restricts the queen down into the bottom uh, where, the, uh, where the brood is. Um, this allows us to collect clean honey in the honey supers above. And then above that, we have different kinds of lids. This is called a telescoping cover or a telescoping lid. It reaches down and over the box, sheds water really well. It's a great lid. 
But the one problem is, is that um, if you want to move bees like our migratory beekeepers do, those lids don't, that you can't stack beehives close together because the lids overlap. So we have a different kind of lid we call a migratory lid that sits on top and is flush to the sides. That way we can stack bee boxes on pallets and stack those pallets on trucks. Un oh, underneath the lid, the cover, we may have an inner cover and that allows ventilation and it also is necessary for these telescoping covers because like I said, the bees will produce that propolis, they'll glue everything together, they'll glue that telescoping cover down, you won't be able to get it off. Um, so if you want to get a beehive started, this is, these are the bare essentials. You need a bottom board, you need a brood box with its frames, you need a queen excluder, you need one or more supers, and then as the bees grow, you need to add more boxes to it. So you need, typically need more than just this for a beekeeping operation or at least a hive. All right, get back to where we were. Okay, um, bees are livestock. They are managed in much the same way. Lots of times we concentrate bees um, in larger aggregations than they would normally occur um, because we may need to migrate to a crop or, um, you know, bees are going to disperse in a forest naturally. We don't want them every three, four hundred yards all over the forest, we'd like to have them in one apiary. So sometimes we actually have to feed them supplementally. And there are times when we actually want to provide extra food too so that they grow faster, produce more bees, produce more comb. So there are a variety of different feeders that you will see out there. Um, this is called a Boardman feeder. It's an entrance feeder. They're cool in that you can see the sugar syrup that you provide to them and whether or not they've eaten it, um, but it's not enough. In fact, most beekeepers will tell you a little quart jar will not supply them with the sugar needs that they need at certain times of year. What we need is provide gallons. So if you're going to get into beekeeping, it might be fun to produce, get one of these. I use them for my small hives. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but if you're going to provide feed, you're going to need something that can produce a large volume such as pails that are set on top, these uh, uh, division board feeders or top feeders that you can actually put gallons of sugar to. Uh, we also can feed the bees the pollen that they need. We can also collect pollen from the bees. Remember I mentioned that the bees stack the pollen on their legs? Well, if we force them to go through a tiny hole, it'll knock the pollen off their bodies and we can trap it. So there are these pollen traps and a variety of feeders that we might use. And then of course, bees sting, right? Uh, if anybody has never told you that bees sting, let me let you know, bees sting. Um, and they will do it even when you are mild-mannered with them. Um, so we do protect ourselves. Most experienced beekeepers learn how to work bees, and the bees just don't want to sting. They're just not going to get elicit that defense response. Uh, but the last thing you want to do is get a sting to the eye because that could actually cause lasting damage. Most honeybee stings not going to cause lasting damage. Local pain, local swelling goes away within a day. Um, but if you get it in the eye, it's a problem. So at minimum, a new, a new beekeeper needs a veil, something to keep them off of the face. Most beekeepers will get some sort of jacket or suit. And if you're down here in Georgetown County and you want to do this, I highly recommend these vented suits. Those canvas suits are too hot. Oh my Lord, they're hot. Uh, and you got to work bees in the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer. And so it's, it's not, uh, it's not sweat free work. Let's put it that way. Um, many folks will protect their hands with, uh, gloves. Um, I actually wear these neoprene gloves, um, or yeah, Nalgene gloves. Um, just mainly because all the sticky stuff I'm dealing with. Uh, I'm not worried so much about the bees stinging me. They can sting through that. They don't normally. But all that propolis, the honey, the wax, everything that's in there, it'll just get all over everything. So I wear those mainly just to keep myself clean. Um, they do have gloves that are made out of leather or canvas that don't allow the bee to sting you. If you're really concerned about getting stung, you can. The problem with these, though, is they're bulky, and you actually end up smushing bees trying to work the bees more so with those than you would if you just didn't have gloves at all. You'll make the bees matter 
with these big bulky gloves than if you didn't have gloves at all. Now, once you um, have learned how to keep bees and you're keeping bees in, in these colonies, um, you will probably get to the point where you actually can produce some surplus honey. And we have a bunch of equipment that you use to extract and cleanse that honey. Um, at the very least, you need some sort of knife that will remove the cappings. Um, what I mean by that is honeybees, when they collect nectar, that nectar is mostly water. When it comes out of the plant, it's mostly water. Problem is, a little bit of sugar and a lot of water is going to ferment or, uh, or mold. So what the bees do is they actually ingest the nectar, add some enzymes from within their body, regurgitate the nectar into the cells, and then dry it. And that is what we call honey. It has a very, very high sugar concentration and very, very low moisture content. In fact, the actual number is 18.6%. When honey gets below 18.6% moisture, it no longer ferments or molds. It can last in that state forever. It'll, um, and that's why the bees dry it. Once it gets to that temperature or that moisture level, they will take a wax capping and they'll put it over the cell so that no moisture can get into the sugar. Uh, into the honey. So we have to remove those cappings if we want to get to the honey. So you get a knife, they're hot knives, they're serrated knives, well, a bunch of different things, but you cut the cappings off. Um, the cappings go into some sort of bin and you'll notice that there's a screen in the bottom with a gate so that the honey that was in the cappings can drain out. Uh, we take those frames and we set them into an extractor which spins the honey out of the comb and then that um, those extracted frames can actually be given back to the bees for them to start putting more honey into. So like I said, we don't actually destroy the comb in the process of collecting the honey. Once you've got those cappings or other wax, um, you can actually render down that wax to make candles and cosmetics and so forth. And we use solar melters, you can use um, hot water baths or, or what we call rendering, um, wax rendering uh, pails and you can make your candles and a variety of other things. So there's all these accessories. If you pick up a catalog of bee equipment, it's going to be like that thick. There's thousands of different things you could buy in there. I'm telling you, keep it simple, right? You need the hive equipment. You need the safety equipment. Eventually, you might get to the point where you can extract honey. If you are just a small backyard beekeeper with one or two colonies, there is no need to actually invest in all this. You can actually take honey and you can crush it. You can, you'll destroy the comb, but you can crush it and strain it and still get good honey without having to have an extractor, knives, capping tanks, and all that stuff. Um, when you've extracted the honey, though, it contains little parts of bees, some pollen. Uh, it's got bits of wax and other things in it. So it does have to be filtered. When you buy a bottle of honey and it says raw honey, it is true honey. It's exactly what the bees made and came out of the, the comb, but it has been filtered. If it says unfiltered, that's what they're saying. It has not been pressure filtered. All honey has been filtered just to get the large debris out. Um, that's the best honey. But for commercial honey producers, they want a bottle of honey that stays clear on a grocery shelf for years, right? And doesn't turn to sugar crystals. So they remove fine particles by pressure filtering the honey. Pressure filtered honey does not contain the pollen and the other benefits that actual raw honey does. Um, so this is another reason why it's best to get honey from your local beekeeper. It's not been pressure filtered. It's not been um, processed in a way to make it stable for uh, grocery sale. Keep doing that. Um, if you start collecting wax, um, there are a whole bunch of cool things that you can do with that wax. Um, basically, we just want to heat it up enough to be able to melt it, and then we can pour it into molds, we can make candles. Um, wax can be used in cosmetics such as lipsticks, balms, lotions, a variety of other compounds that require a wax component. But like I said, since beeswax is digestible and burns clean, it is a preferred wax for co cosmetic purposes. If you want to get lip balms and other, it's a better lip balm if it has beeswax as its base. 
that is fine and dandy. And for hobby beekeepers just getting into it, you know, you can get all the fun you would ever want out of bees just through the honey and the wax there. But believe it or not, you can make money off of bees in many other ways. Um, one of the most important ways for our commercial beekeepers is actually to sell the bees themselves. Over the past couple decades, there have been issues with bees. We're going to get to those in a second. Um, and bees have been declining or, or dying at a faster rate. Um, that means, one, beekeepers need more bees regularly. And two, the story has gotten out to the general public. And beekeeping's kind of become popular because people want to save the bees, they want to help the bees, and, and they've heard the stories about bees in distress and decline. So they're inclined to get into beekeeping, and there's all these bees that you can sell to these new beekeepers that are coming out, and you can get a lot of money. These numbers are out of date. Packages right now with uh, inflation and so forth are going for about $150. Nukes, I've seen them uh, up over 200 and then if you actually want to get a full hive, you're you're going to spend a lot of money, $350, $400 on a, on a full hive. Let me mention this too real quick. You see this thing here? We call this a nucleus hive. If you're going to get started in beekeeping, there are a couple different ways of doing it. One, you can buy this thing called a package. What a package is, is it's basically three pounds of bees, or about 10,000 bees, in a box with a mated queen. There's no equipment, there's no comb, there's nothing. That is basically like a swarm. Um, and what you have to do is you have to build all the equipment, you have to put the bees into the equipment and get them to start drawing the comb. It takes a lot of time and investment for the bees to do it. That's why packages are the cheapest. It also means that bees are gonna take a couple years. You're not gonna do real well in producing honey the first year with a package. It takes a while for them to build up and get to the point where they can produce honey. Um, frame, or these nucleus hives are like little mini hives, five frames rather than 10 or eight frames. And they already have comb, they already have food already in there, they have baby bees and brood already. So they are already halfway there. So if you are a beginning beekeeper and you don't have any equipment and you've never um, built any comb or anything, my recommendation is to consider starting with a nucleus hive. You get a little five frame box, and you get the frames that come with it, and bees that are already on their way. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's a better guarantee of success. Um, you can do packages, but just understand, guard your expectations in your first year. Uh, and then buying mature hives, um, I don't normally recommend it because two reasons. You're not exactly sure how the beekeeper that made those hives has been tending to them, whether or not they've been keeping on top of pests and diseases. Uh, they're very expensive, um, and uh, you don't know the condition of the equipment necessarily. So for a new beekeeper, my typical recommendation is to think about a nucleus hive or maybe a couple packages. Yeah. Um, Believe it or not, there are other ways of getting freebies. And uh, bees do this thing called swarming. Uh, we're gonna get into biology in just a second, but w when the bees swarm, the colony divides. And the queen leaves with a large portion of the workforce. They, they go hang out on a tree somewhere waiting to find a new home. Well, if you find that cluster of bees hanging on that tree, well, you've got a queen and a bunch of worker bees that you could start a new colony with. So a lot of our beekeepers seek out these swarms, or they, they hope that the general public calls them when they see a swarm, because they'll collect that swarm and they'll start a new colony from it. Some of our beekeepers are brave enough to actually do cutouts. When bees get into houses and structures, it's messy, hot work. Beekeepers typically don't do this for free. Um, and a lot of beekeepers actually will avoid these because it's construction work, it's demo work, and you might cut into electrical wires or, or water lines or whatever, so the beekeepers, since they're not contractors, tend to avoid that. We have a select few people that will actually do this. Um, uh, Rick Duvall does the, do either of y'all ever do cutouts? Have you ever, uh, yeah. Okay, all right, well good. I'll send some of your way down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and so these cutouts, it, it, a swarm is easy because it's just a cluster of bees hanging there. We shake them in, we get them started new by. Cut out, you got to remove all that material. See, if we just were to kill the bees inside that wall, all those bees, that comb, and all that stuff is going to start to rot, and then it's just going to be a nasty mess. So when you get bees in a structure, they need to be cut out. They have to be removed from that structure to avoid future problems. Oop, go back. All right, so you can start bees for free, but you still have to buy the equipment and all that stuff too. So, you know, there's, a, there's expense. Let me just say, if you're trying to figure out what your budget would be, with the wood and wear, the hives and the frames and all that stuff, the tools, the safety equipment, smokers, um, and then the bees themselves, expect to hunt, spend about $1,000 right out the gate. That's a pretty good number to get one colony started. I usually recommend that you consider starting multiple colonies. Um, think about it like this. If I was going to start a cattle operation, would I just start with one cow? No, because I'm going to need a bull at some point to, to reproduce that cow. So what it's, you don't need two colonies to reproduce them, but what you do need is you need multiple colonies to blend and manage an apiary. You're going to have one colony that's strong and doing really well and being very productive. One colony that's eh, okay, it's doing right, and one colony that's declining. So if I were to recommend for any new beekeeper, start with at least two or maybe three colonies out the gate because one of the three will be productive and you can use that one of the three to maintain your operation into the future. Um, if you just start with one, the likelihood of you having to buy another colony the next year is pretty high. If you get a good strong colony, we can split it. We can make more bees from that. Once you've bought bees one time, you should never have to buy bees ever again because bees have extreme product, productivity that allows you to make new bee colonies from them. So let's talk about how we do that. And the only way we do that is to understand the biology of the bee real quick. So bees are social. They have division of labor. They have a queen who lays eggs in the colony and maintains the workforce. They have workers, which are most of the bees in the colony, and they are building the comb, collecting the food, raising the brood, um, defending the colony. The workers are pretty much most of the bees that you see. But then there's these big fat fuzzy bees that you'll see walking around in there. They're really noisy and they can't sting. They're the drones. And the drones, their only job is to transfer genetic material to the queen so that she can be productive and lay eggs. So they inseminate the queen and that's it. That's all their job is. They don't build comb, they don't defend the colony, nothing. Um, bees are extremely adaptable. Um, the colony itself, that queen, all the workers and drones, is a, an organism into itself. And we as beekeepers manage that organism as a unit. We don't manage individual bees, we manage colonies. Um, those colonies may get as large as 60 plus thousand individuals. Um, I have a, a couple colonies right now that are stacked five or six boxes tall and every single box is slap full with bees on every single frame. Um, that's probably a colony of 80 or 90,000 bees right now. So from 90,000 bees, we have the ability to split and divide and make new bee colonies from them. Um, the workers are interesting in that as they age, they change their roles in the colony. When that first work, when that emer worker first emerges out of the comb uh, as a new adult bee, her first job is to clean. She keeps house. She cleans her cell out. She goes around cleaning the colony, making sure it's ready for the next generation of, of baby bees. As she gets a little bit older, she starts to venture out of the hive and she may either become a guard bee or defender bee, or she may become a forager. And the foragers are the ones who go out looking for flowers to collect pollen and nectar or the resins uh, from plants to get, make the propolis or the, the bee gum. Those foragers work extremely hard, so hard that they don't live for but about 30 to 40 days. In the summertime, worker bees are dying every 30 to 40 days. 
which means that it is critical that the queen is constantly laying eggs to re reproduce the workforce, which means that the most important component in the bee colony is the queen, a strong, productive queen who lays lots of eggs. This is why we have to be able to monitor bee colonies, because we have to go into a colony and look to see how the queen's doing. Is she laying eggs? Are there new baby bees coming along? What's the size of the workforce? Um, and because the more workers I've got, the more food's coming in, the more honey I'm going to produce. So that's what we're doing is when we're managing or monitoring bee colonies. When we keep bees, we're watching them, we're feeding them, we're monitoring them, we're dividing and reproducing them. That's beekeeping in its essence, right there. Um, okay. There we go. So the worker bees are very interesting in their anatomy, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but there are a couple fa factors about their anatomy which are just fascinating. Number one, all that beeswax that they're building the comb from, they don't collect it from the world around them. They make it from their own bodies. They make it from the sugars that they ingest. And they have glands on their abdomen which produce these wax flakes. And then the worker bees take the wax flakes, chew the wax, and form the comb into the honeycomb cells. Um, and then those honeycomb cells are round, actually, but they're stacked in a way that there are six cells around any given cell, which means they look like they're hexagonal. Right? The comb is of different sizes and shapes depending on what it's used for. Um, oh yeah, I don't get into that too much here. But there are parts of the comb that are for raising bees. There are parts of the comb that are for collecting food and storing the, the pollen and the nectar. There are also parts of the comb where they raise drones and queens. And drones and queens are different sizes from the workers, so those are different size combs. To build that comb and grow the colony, they have certain food needs. One, nectar. Nectar is the sugars. That's the carbohydrates that power flight. Two, pollen. That's the protein that they use to generate the food that they feed to the larvae. They don't feed their babies protein. They eat the protein and from glands in their mouth produce the food that they feed to the bees. So the workers are actually feeding the bees from their own secretions. Um, but pollen is necessary to produce those secretions. They need water as well. Water is used to thin and reconstitute honey, but it's also used to regulate temperature in the colony. In that area where the baby bees are produced, they will maintain that colony at 93 degrees Fahrenheit, even in the middle of the winter. So what they do is they ingest the nectar or honey and sugar, vibrate their flight muscles and generate heat, and that keeps the brood area warm. In the summertime, it might get to be too hot, hotter than 93 degrees outside, and they need to cool it. So what they'll do is they'll go collect water, and then they will exude water out while they are fanning their wings, and they will basically, through evaporation, cool the inside of the hive. And then they also collect tree resin as well. That tree resin is chewed into this stuff we call propolis. This is the bee gum I mentioned that they glue everything together with. Um, it's funny, bees, they're like little robots and they can measure the world around them with their antennae. If there is a space that's bigger than three-eighths of an inch, they will build comb into it. They will build comb, a wax foundation into it. If there is a space that is less than a quarter of an inch, they jam it full of this glue, this propolis. So they maintain these spaces between frames, between three-eighths of an inch and a quarter inch. We call it bee space. This is why frames are designed the way they are. This is why boxes are designed the way they are, is to prevent the bees from building comb or jamming the spaces full of, of propolis. Question is, you've got thousands of bees in that colony and new bees are becoming foragers every day. How do those new bees know where to go get the food, where to find the water, where to get the resins for the propolis? Well, bees have this remarkable, remarkable ability to communicate with each other. They can talk to each other and they do it through dance and sound. 
So um, you may have heard this story before. Bees do something called a waggle dance. And the waggle dance encodes three pieces of information. It encodes the direction of the food resource, it encodes the distance of the food resource, and the quality of the food resource. So here's what happens. Worker bee goes out, finds a flower, and the flowers are really productive and got great food. So she collects some of the nectar or the pollen that's in that flower, and she flies back to the colony. When she comes into that colony, all the house bees are like, oh, you just found something good. So they start paying attention to her. And she starts to do this figure eight dance while she's in there. And what she's doing is she's giving them direction and distance coordinates. Um, so what she does is, based upon the angle of the sun, if her little waggle dance is, like say the sun's straight overhead, and she will on the comb vibrate her body going straight up towards the sun, and then she'll circle around, she'll do it again, circle around, do it again. What she's telling the bees in the colony is go directly at the sun. The vigor with which she vibrates her body tells them how far to go. So she'll, she'll just go real slow when it's close by, and if it's way far away, she vibrates really fast. And, and then that tells them, okay, and then when she's done with her dance, she gives all the bees that have been paying attention a little taste of what she found. And the bees get all excited, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's good stuff. We're going. And they go out, and they go to find the food. Um, the more of that's going on, the more foraging they do. Right now, we are in the peak of the spring nectar flow. There's lots of flowers, lots of food out there, and the bees are dancing vigorously inside the colony. It's really cool stuff to watch. Um, I have a video, but I'm going to refrain from that for right now. Um, bees are organized, too. They would prefer to maintain a sense of order in the colony. So what they do is they use the central part of the colony for raising brood. Remember, they have to keep it warm, right, and cool. So the center of the colony is the brood area. And in the brood area, the queen is laying eggs, and what she will do is she will lay in concentric circles, basically going from the, the oldest larvae out. And then by the time she's getting to the outer uh, perimeter of there, these inner bees are starting to emerge. So what happens is the brood area is constantly being backfilled with new eggs to produce new workers. Right around the edge of that brood area is where they store the pollen, or what we call bee bread. So you will see in the combs yellow, green, red, brown, purple, all sorts of different colors depending upon what kind of flower they've been visiting for the pollen. Uh, we have a, a flower that blooms early in the spring called henbit. Henbit is a weedy mint kind of flower, and the pollen in it is as bright pink as any pink you've ever seen. It, it's fascinating to see it coming in. Um, around the, the sides and over the top, they pack the honey. And there's two reasons for that. One, um, the, having the honey over top actually serves as a thermal barrier. Y'all know moisture tends to hold temperature better, right? So that honey will hold temperature better and creates a roof that essentially helps them maintain the heat around the brood area. Um, so this is why bees tend to pack honey uh, above the brood area, and this is why we use supers. They will tend to put the honey up top, and if we put boxes on top of the colony, it's more likely to be honey boxes up there. Those baby bees um, have to go through a life cycle, and the queen lays an egg, and that egg takes three days to hatch. Depending upon if it's a worker, a drone, or a new queen, that development of that larvae may be different time frames. Um, for a typical worker, it's 21 days. So every worker took 21 days to develop into the adult bee. And you can actually see in the image here, these are what the eggs look like. These are what the first instar larvae look like. And then they get bigger and bigger as they go to uh, get older. Um, you know, insects molt, right? They shed their skin to get bigger. So they go through a series of stages. Bees have five stages or five instars before they come and become an adult. 
if it's a worker, 21 days. If it's a drone, 24 days. But look at this. The queens actually produce much faster. What would be the advantage of a queen, who's actually larger than all the other bees in the colony, of her developing faster? Think about it. Well, the main reason is if they have to replace a queen, the old queen dies or they swarm and the old queen leaves, well, they need a new queen as quickly as possible. So evolutionarily speaking, they've been driven towards producing queens faster. This is really important for our beekeepers to know because if we want to produce new bees and make new colonies, we need to know how to make queens. And we need to know the schedule and be able to monitor that schedule as we produce bees. Um, different kinds of comb produce different kinds of brood. So the workers have these cool little, uh, I don't know, it's almost like golf ball, like you roll the golf ball over the comb, little low cappings. Um, the drones are fatter than workers, so they use the edges of the comb and they make these big cells and the, the tops of the cells stick way up and above the comb. And then the queens are the largest and they make these queen cells. So when you're going through a colony, this is what we as beekeepers are looking for. We're looking for the brood, the eggs, the larvae. We're looking to see if we have capped workers, capped drone. And then we're also, this time of year, looking for these things. Because this is the time of year when bees naturally reproduce or swarm. So we as beekeepers, we want to keep an eye on this. We might like swarming. We, we might actually want to make new bee colonies. And every queen is a potential new colony. So if we get a bee colony that starts producing queens like this, we can actually harvest those queens. Take bees, that queen, put them in a new box, we got a whole new colony. Um, or if I'm a honey producer, the last thing I want to do is lose my queen because it's going to be 16 days before you make a new one. It's going to be another couple uh, or a week or so before she gets mated. It's going to be another week before she starts reproducing. And then it's going to be 21 days before that next worker comes out. So if I lose a queen during the middle of the nectar flow, I've pretty much missed all the nectar. They're, it's going to take too long to start making workers to produce uh, honey. So we actually try to prevent swarming and queen uh, swarm cell production in colonies that we want to collect honey from. That's a much more detailed conversation that I will reserve for another day. Um, as the bees get larger in the springtime, the colonies get larger in the springtime, getting ready for the nectar spring or the nectar flow, um, they start getting really congested in the hive and they start making those queen cells. When those queen cells mature and get capped, the bees know that it is basically time to reproduce or divide or swarm. Uh, so what we do as beekeepers is we watch that, we monitor that and maybe try to prevent it um, so that the bees remain productive. But every now and then the bees take off and they swarm. And these swarms are not dangerous. They're not defensive. They're not trying to protect their food and brood inside the colony. They're just trying to find a new home. So typically when you see this cluster of bees or this cloud of bees flying through your yard um, and everybody gets really scared because there's all these bees and this loud noise going on, this is the, the least of your concerns. They are not defensive and are not going to sting. I collect swarm clusters with no safety gear. Now, it's not what I recommend for everybody else. I'd suggest if you try it, wear your safety gear the first, first time, but you'll find out the bees are super docile when they're in a swarm and, uh, and they're easy to work with. Um, they do it this time of year because this is when the most food is available. So every year, a bee colony goes through a sequence of events, and we as beekeepers need to understand the sequence of events. Basically, let me tell you how it goes. Towards the end of the season, when it's starting to get close to frost, the bees that have been producing that year start to uh, calm down or, or, or start to collect in the colony. And when it's cold outside, they will cluster up inside of the colony to protect whatever brood and food that they have left. When it gets cold in the wintertime, those clusters tighten up and they generate heat in there just to maintain the colony through the, the year or the winter. In the springtime, 
that colony starts to build up and get stronger. The queen starts laying eggs, they start producing more brood, and they're getting ready for the spring nectar flow. This month, next month, and into June are the peak of the swarm season. Once we get into the summer though, especially here at the coast, a um, lot of our food resources that were plentiful in the spring start to get limited. So mid-summer we actually have this thing we call a dearth where food is not as available. The bees slow down and they kind of just maintain through the summer waiting for the fall when the golden rods and the asters and the other plants start blooming again. Um, we as beekeepers understand that process and we use that sequence of events to maintain healthy colonies and strong apiaries. Problem is, as with any cultured animal or crop, there are pests and diseases that will take advantage of our, ours and the bees' good work. So you as beekeepers need to know that, you know, it's not all fun and games. You know, there are problems with bees. And this is actually the part of beekeeping that is giving us the most challenge. This is why we're experiencing the losses that we have now. So let me talk about it briefly. Um, there are a series of diseases. Historically, this American fowl brood, which attacks the, the larvae of the bees, will destroy a colony, and it is so infectious and uh, you can't treat it or, or uh, prevent it. Or you can prevent it, but you can't treat it. The colony must be destroyed to deal with it. So if a colony gets American fowl brood, the only solution is eradication. And that's a bad thing for a beekeeper. There are a series of other diseases that we need to learn about. If you are going to get into beekeeping, you need to take a course in beekeeping because we address these different diseases and how to manage them so that you can maintain healthy bees. We have some pests also. Um, old world pests that grew up with bees, something called the wax moth. The wax moth does not kill honeybee colonies. Wax moths are just a cleanup crew. When a bee colony starts to die or decline from some other reason, the wax moths eat the old comb, and that's where they get their nutrition. So wax moths don't go into a colony that's already strong and has lots of bees. The bees find the caterpillars, they throw them out of the colony, they maintain the colony. But when a colony gets weak, the bees are not covering all the comb, the wax moths move in and take advantage of it. I get lots of calls from beekeepers saying the wax moths killed my colony. That's not what happened. The wax moths are just cleaning up. Something else killed the colony. Something else like small hive beetles. Um, South Carolina is blessed to be the first state in the United States of, of America to get the small hive beetle. This is a predator and a scavenger that goes into bee colonies. It eats bee larvae, it eats bee bread, it eats honey and it leaves behind a slimy, nasty mess when it does it. Um, we can keep colonies strong and the colonies will keep the be beetles at bay. But just like with the wax moths, the um, weakening colonies, the small hive beetles will take advantage of it. The problem is small hive beetles can actually get bad enough where they actually start to infect the next colony and cause it to decline and the next colony. So if you have an apiary of 20 colonies and one of them dies for some bad reason and the, the beetles get started there, they'll work their way through the apiary, killing other colonies. So we, we have to control this thing. We can do it. It's pretty easy. The number one absolute best thing you can do, put your beehives in full sun. Wax, or the bee, beetles just don't do well in full sun. You keep your bees in shade, you're going to have beetle problems. It's just pretty, it's, it's that easy. Um, there are other ways of trapping, and I, I'm not going to get into it too much right now. Just know that there are these pests. Believe it or not, bees actually get mites inside their breathing tubes, too. We can't see them, but we can see the health effects of, the, of these tracheal mites. But the number one biggest issue, this critter right here. So back in the 1980s, um, this little mite, was first found in the United States inside bee colonies. When I say little mite, it's actually pretty darn big. You can see it with the naked eye. And this mite is a parasite of bees. It reproduces on the larval bees, but it actually can feed on any bee. 
And um, it's kind of like you having a tick on you the size of a softball and a tick that transfers a bunch of diseases. So when this mite moved in, it spread across North America, in fact, actually spread across the entire world within just a few years. And uh, when the mite gets into colonies, it reproduces when the bees are reproducing. And as the mite numbers come up, the diseases in that colony come up and eventually the colony collapses. Back in the early 2000s, we called this ph phenomenon colony collapse disorder. It was just weird, like bees that looked perfectly fine in the summertime, when they got to the fall and winter, just left the colony. And all that was left behind was the brood and the food, and the bees just seemed to abandon. And so we didn't know what was causing it, and we, so we just call it colony collapse disorder. We have since learned that it's almost entirely due to this mite. The mite comes in, feeds on the bees, transfers diseases. As the colony gets weaker during the fall, the bees cannot maintain themselves with the mites and the viruses present. And so they just leave and they leave behind all the food or they die outright because they're just unhealthy. The single most important thing you can do as a beekeeper is to stay on type of the mites. If you don't do anything else in beekeeping, you don't feed the bees, you don't monitor the bees, you don't do anything, if you keep the mites at bay and control the mites, you will be a successful beekeeper for the most part. Now, there are other problems we got to deal with, but this is public enemy number one. This is why we are experiencing 40% colony losses nationwide every single year. Um, good news is bees are very productive. We talked about how, much, how many bees they can produce. Um, a single queen can lay 2,000 eggs a day. So bees can overcome these losses if we manage them well. And that's exactly what beekeepers are doing right now. They are losing colonies, but they're replacing those colonies. So due to the ingenuity of beekeepers and their stubbornness maybe, <laughs> they have actually maintained bee colonies at a consistent level for about the past eight or nine years. Uh, we're not losing bees, but what we're having to do is replace bee colonies more regularly, which means it is much more expensive to keep bees now than it was 30 years ago. And that's the big problem. You're not gonna make as much money keeping bees now as you would have back in the 70s before this mite showed up. When the mite gets into a colony, you start to see all sorts of problems, but what you'll mainly see is this thing we call snot brood. Basically, the the larvae just liquefy in the cells and they look like balls of snot sitting in the bottom of the cell. Uh, if you start to see this condition, the mites have already become a major problem. You may or may not be able to bring that colony back. Um, so it's important that we stay ahead of things like snot brood and this deformed wing virus we see on bees. Um, and the, the trick basically is we can monitor for our mites. No, I don't have it. Um, what we do is we wash the mites. I mean, we wash the bees in alcohol. We kill some bees, knock the mites loose. We can count our mites. When we know that we get a certain number of mites, we've got to treat for them or do something to interrupt the mite production. If we don't do that, that colony will die eventually. So there's a lot of work and research on mites right now, like trying to develop bees that are hygienic or resistant to the mites, but we just haven't gotten there yet. Um, if you're going to get into beekeeping, you need to learn about the Varroa mite, that's what this thing's called, and how to control it. If you don't do anything else, that's the number one issue. Um, there's all sorts of other issues with dealing with bees. Here at the coast, well, probably our biggest issue are storms. You know, our our wind, wind storms in the fall um, are, can be a major problem for bees, so we have to take precautions to strap bees and get them ready for any storms and things like that. Make sure we put them in places that don't flood, stuff like that. To learn more information about bees, there are a bunch of different resources out there. Number one, my program. So the apiculture program, I've got a website. You can just search Clemson Beekeeping, Clemson Apiculture. You can get to my website. And I've got resources that link you to a whole bunch of other fun stuff. Um, Another thing that would be important would be to join a local association and maybe the state association. That's where you can learn from your fellow beekeepers that are in the world right around you. They know the problems you have to deal with in Georgetown County. You have experienced beekeepers right here in your backyard 
that would be happy to mentor you and help you get started. The Blackwater Beekeepers meets in Conway um, once a month, and the Charleston Beekeepers meet in Charleston once a month. Um, Florence has a PD. They, they're a little bit weaker uh, group. They're looking for members. They're looking for some leadership. They are meeting monthly, I think, right now. Um, but the problem with Florence is they had gotten, when COVID happened, they got kicked out of the place they were meeting. And I don't think they've got a good permanent location to meet now. I want to say there was a Lutheran church or something like that that they were meeting at. Yeah, they're on Facebook. Look up PD Beekeepers. Okay. Yeah. Um, they are not providing any trainings, though, right now. Um, if you would like to go through a training, let me tell you about an option. Um, I had scheduled a hybrid training, a virtual training, where you could learn from home um, with, through lectures that I was going to do online, and then we would schedule field days. I was going to have field day in Florence. That's where my office is up at PD Rec. Um, so you come out, get into the bees with me. We'll teach you about bees in the bee yard. Uh, the problem was I have a family health issue that has developed recently, and I had to postpone that training. Um, uh, my wife's got to leave town for several weeks, and so uh, it's going to probably be towards the end of the summer before I reschedule that. So if you would like to go through an entry-level training, I will have one. You can uh, sit from your computer at home and... Uh, ask questions and watch the presentations. We'll go through stuff like the pests and diseases in more detail. Um, but uh, it's probably not going to be till the end of the, the summer before we get to that. There are some other resources out there too. Oh, I'm going to forget about that. I got a newsletter. If you go to my website, over here on the left-hand column, it says cappings. Um, right below this, you can't see it because it's cut off, but there's a, two fields. You put your name and your email address. And when my newsletter is published, you'll get a notification in your email that the newsletter is there to read. And it looks a little something like, there, oh, there it goes, something like that. Um, it's called Cappings. Cappings. Anyway, this Clemson Apiculture and Pollinator Program. And uh, the Cappings basically gives you a, a, a background on what our program's up to, um, things we're seeing in our apiaries. Uh, I've got a section on what's going on in your hives that month and what you might want to think about in management. Uh, I've also got some information about beekeeping, yes sir, um, beekeeping um, conservation efforts in the state. And if you're somebody who likes plants and other things, I usually cover some plant that bees use for food uh, or maybe an insect that's also a pollinator, whatever. Um, so newsletter's got some fun stuff in it. And then in South Carolina, we have an apiary inspection program. We can actually provide testing for the diseases that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you have bees and you were suspecting that you might have foul brood or something like that, um, just contact me or, or our program, uh, and I'll get you in touch with the testing services. One of the best resources is the State Beekeepers Association. And the State Beekeepers Association has two meetings every year, a spring meeting that happens the last weekend in February and a summer meeting, which is typically the last weekend in July. I think it's actually the 21st through the 23rd this year. Um, it'll be in Columbia. This is a conference where all the beekeepers from the whole state come together and we invite researchers and, and speakers from other states to come in and tell us about what's going on with varroa mites or or some other fun thing related to beekeeping. Uh, this year's theme is going to be growing your operation. So we're going to talk about how to split colonies and make new colonies to grow your operation. We're also going to have a session on business management. So for those of you that actually want to produce bees for an income, uh, we will talk about what it takes to make a bee business in South Carolina. Um, I think it'll be a good conference as well. And then there's journals. Um, bee Culture and American Bee Journal are pretty much the two bis biggest journals. Uh, they are written in a way that they're not like scientific jargon. They're fun. they got good authors and, and they're, they're easy to read. But they really tackle some pretty complex subjects in beekeeping. If you want to go on a national scale, we've got the American Bee Federation, the American Honey Producers Association, uh, and Eastern Apiculture Society that have massive meetings. In fact, y'all missed it. Just about four years ago, American Bee Federation was in Myrtle Beach. It was the first time they'd ever been in South Carolina. 
And we had a great time at the convention center over there. They even built a bee sand castle inside of the convention center for us. It was pretty cool. I know we're getting towards the end here. Um, if you are not necessarily inclined to getting into keeping bees, but you would like to protect pollinators and help with conservation efforts, there are groups out there that have like minds. Pollinator Partnership, the Xerxes Society, um, they are willing to help and provide expertise for groups that want to do conservation, plant pollinator gardens, put in bee houses, things like that. Um, you can even get Georgetown certified as a bee city USA, kind of like a tree city USA, but for bees. Um, and, uh, and if you just want to support beekeepers but don't necessarily want to keep bees, when you're going and looking for your uh, black cherries, blueberries, almonds next time, look for this little emblem right here. The growers that are producing those crops will get their crops certified as a bee-friendly crop. And uh, you might choose to purchase that one product over another because you know that on their farms they are taking pollinators into account and are trying to protect them as best they can. Uh, I'm going to move on. USDA has some programs. I've already talked about those. And then also the last thing, you don't have to necessarily keep honeybees if that's just not your ball. You know, maybe you want to keep some bees around the yard. You want to keep the garden um, pollinated. Uh, or maybe you've got flowers that you, you like to see bees visiting, um, but you don't want to build a beehive. Well, you can get other bees, like these mason bee houses, orchard bee houses. There are other bees that you can do on small scale in backyard operations, which can provide you the pollination services, and actually, arguably, are even better pollinators than the European honeybee, because these kinds of bees live for a very short period of time during the year. They got to get it done when the, when the time's right. So they will actually pollinate at a much more vigorous rate and they will pollinate their particular plant, not whatever the best flowering plant is in the area. So I'd encourage you, think about putting mason and orchard bee and leaf cutter bee houses in your garden to help out with pollination. That's basically it. I think I went way over. Um, yeah, all right. Um, Y'all are welcome to throw some questions at me if you'd like. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, but now even my gloves, I've got stung through my gloves. You have the leather gloves? The, well, yeah. Yeah. And even the, even the rubber gloves, oh, yeah. those are better for me, but I, I didn't have that day, so I got stung twice, and my arm swelled up like three times the size. Mm, okay. So, and that's how they affect me. Right. So, but you don't feel shortness of breath or high heart rate or anything? I do, I do have an itch in the Okay, well, good. So, not, I'm not a medical professional, but what I would suggest you do is talk with your doctor, and he may recommend that if you're going to go work your bees, go ahead and take a Benadryl before you do that. Okay. That will reduce the allergy reaction and l much less likely to develop anaphylaxis. Okay. It's not an absolute, but no, so, yeah, it would. It would. And, and, out there that is they, well, they've got those ones that you, you see the murder hornets? The, yeah. Yeah, they got these suits that they use for hornets, which have much longer stingers, but you can't work bees in those things. They're like space suits. Yeah. Um, you might use rubber gloves under your leather gloves. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, it, you know, there's no absolute bee proof suit. If you're going to keep bees, you're going to get stung. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. Just like carpenters get splinters. And, and construction workers smash their thumbs. You know, there are hazards with every trade. Uh, minimize it with the Benadryl or talk with your doctor about whatever prescription you might want to get or okay. over the counter. Yes, ma'am. I do have one question. Um, when I moved here almost 15 years ago, I brought hives with me because mm -hmm. I had been keeping bees. And I brought them with me to the office. And they were very <laughs> he was a good guy. He was a good guy. We miss you, man. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what did you experience when you had the bees die? What was what, what did you see? Okay. Well, so let let me yes. So mosquito control is a balance because we do live in a part of the world where mosquitoes that bear some of the worst diseases that humankind has ever had to experience exist. Um, you know, the the largest mass casualty events that have ever happened in the United States have happened right here in this area, Charleston, Savannah, and so forth as a result of mosquito-borne diseases. So there is a concern about maintaining them. You know. Now, to some degree, that threat is not nearly as bad as it used to be because the kinds of mosquitoes that we have now are not the same mosquitoes we had then. That being said, we've got new ones that have come around, such as Zika and West Nile virus and so forth. So there will be a need to m do area control for mosquitoes. Um, we one, the threat may be slightly overstated. Now, and I understand that they do occur. The, the kills do occur, and we have, do definitely have documented events. But I'm with you. I actually keep bees in a neighborhood where we have trucks go around, um, and on nights when the truck has come by, I have gone out, and with the wind coming the direction of my bees, I've sat there and watched my bees to see what happened, and the effects are negligible. At, at most, they got agitated. And the reason for it is the volume of insecticide that's used and the size of the droplet. So when the mosquito truck comes by, the amount of insecticide that they are putting out in the environment is a very, very low volume. It's actually called a ULV treatment, ultra low volume treatment. Um, and the dosing that bees get is so small that it usually doesn't even kill individual bees. Um, now, if bees are bearded out on the front of the colony because it's hot in the summertime, there's a chance that the outer layer of bees does get a dose and you have some small colony uh, effect or some bees die. But it never gets inside the colony and kills the whole colony inside. Same thing with the air um, applications. In fact, the air applications is literally tablespoons to the acre. It is a very, very small volume. Um, and the, truck, the, the planes will fly over, and if bees are outside of the colony, there is a chance they will get dosed. But any bees inside colony. So I'm suspicious that what happened, if you had a colony completely die and collapse, something else was contributing there. We've had some um, in other, last spring, um, actually it was summer. Y'all remember when we got right at the end of May, it was like a super deep drought. I mean, it got dry as can be. Well, I got a couple bee kill calls from Charleston area, and I got up with the mosquito guys, and they were like, well, we weren't even in that area is where these bee kills happened. So I called the beekeeper, and, and on my dime, just because I was interested, um, paid for the pesticide analysis, because it just, it looked like pesticides, but it wasn't mosquitoes. So uh, what is this? Well, you know what the only thing that came back was? Atrazine which is an herbicide used in lawn applications or corn production. Well, this is downtown Mount Pleasant, so there's no corn being produced there, so it had to be. What it was, it was so dry, the bees were going to water to collect. Well, the neighbors had done the broadcast granular atrazine on the yard, and those granules had gotten into the gutters and on the driveway, washed into the puddles. The bees went into the puddles to get water, got dosed. And I mean, it killed them deader than hell. I mean, they were all stumbling around. Like, so I'm saying pesticides do happen. The mosquito treatments will kill bees that are out and exposed. They don't kill bees in the colony. Um, so if you experience something similar again, please contact me because I'd love to help you figure out what, what exactly happened. Second thing communicate with your mosquito folks. Most counties, especially the coastal counties, understand the concern, the balance between pollinators and mosquito control and are developing some method for notifying beekeepers or marking hives. 
Um, Horry County has probably one of the most advanced systems because they got a lot of money. And they got trucks that are automated. They GPS the colonies. When the trucks go by, they get into a certain perimeter, they cut off. And the truck will keep driving, but once it gets away from the beehive, it cuts back on. Same thing with the plane. As he's flying over the area, he can actually see the beehives marked on his hive or on his uh, heads up display. He cuts it on and off as he goes over. Um, Georgetown County doesn't quite have an advanced system, but they do try to work with the beekeepers and would be happy to mark your colonies so that they could set up a perimeter. Do understand this, if you read the labels on the pesticides too, human health trumps bees. Oh, yeah, right. Well, and the, so here's the balance that they try to strike. First, they tend to try to confirm that there is actually a mosquito problem. And they do that by the number of calls they get from the area and they may even go do landing. Did, did y'all do landing counts? We did. Okay. Yeah, so they actually, well, the people that go out um, that do the mosquito control will actually go sacrifice them. They'll go to the area where the calls are coming from, they roll up their sleeve and they see how many mosquitoes bite them in the course of a minute or two. And if they, it's a certain amount, then they, they schedule the spray. Um, the other part is that um, if you, if a disease is found in the mosquito population, like Zika, West Nile, or something like that, they're going to spray, and they're going to spray wherever they need to to deal with that disease. Were, did you hear about Flower Town, um, the Dorchester bee kill? That's what happened there. The reason why that lady's lawsuit did not um, go through or she didn't win anything is because Zika was found in the neighborhood right next to their operation and they were contracted to kill the mosquitoes that bore the, mos the Zika there. The bees got tra They tried to notify her. There were some environmental issues that happened. They couldn't spray the night they wanted to because the environment was wrong. They had to postpone it, and that's kind of where the stink came about. But unfortunately, um, if, if there's a disease found in the human population or the mosquito population, the best thing you can do is move or cover your hives um, when you know that the sprays are happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. It's a real complex subject. In fact, actually, I've been asked to go speak at the Mosquito Control Association. Those folks don't want to kill you bees. I know they don't. Um, and they're trying to learn and, and work with beekeepers as much as they can. Ben, thank you. You're quite welcome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it very much. All right. Ben will be here for a few moments. You have other questions. Excellent presentation. Obviously, I love the passion, love the yeah. uh, information. Uh, just to let you know that our next and final for the season, uh, Tuesdays with, will be on May 17th, Tuesday, May 17th. And at that time, Lee Brockington is going to be here to talk on the subject of the Grimke sisters who were abolitionists in Charleston <laughs> before the Civil War. And uh, quite, quite the story. So I hope you'll join us on Tuesday, May 17th. Tim, just a quick word on our, related to this is our seed library. Do you want to talk just briefly? Uh, yeah. we're, we're in the process of, through the library system to bring a seed library to Georgetown. Uh, we met last Tuesday just to see what, what kind of research we can generate. And we're hoping we get some people uh, with some knowledge on how they have been saving seeds. Uh, as an avid gardener, we've been losing our seeds over the last generation. Uh, some things I grew up growing in my garden no longer exist. Uh, I have to either get them online, uh, and in most cases I'm not successful in finding those seeds. So we're, got, we're going to gather a group of folks. We're going to meet next Tuesday, once again at 10 o'clock right here. And if you're interested on in learning how to save seeds or being a part of that group, please come out. We'd love to hear. Uh, mm your method of saving seeds. Because uh, it can be hit or miss. You just can't. You put them in a drawer and then expect to grow them next mm. <laughs> they may My not. system. Oh, yes. Tim, that's awesome. Um, you know, we have a seed library up at Clemson, and we've been keeping heirlooms from yeah. you know, generations ago. Um, they actually sell those seeds, too. So if you needed some starter um, populations, that, yeah, we could get you uh, linked up with them. Uh -huh. I got into that world for a little bit, and uh, I'm done with that. <laughs> Tim and I actually put some together. Yeah. Ooh. 
Well, here's what I will say about rain barrels. They're a great idea, but in practice, it's kind of like feeding bees. It's not nearly enough. If I, what I would do is I'd petition the city to allow for cisterns. I mean, 500 gallons rather than 50. That's what you need. Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, two, two quick resources. One is there is an ongoing lecture series right now that's happening at uh, Carver's Bay right now. And then, and then after that at uh, Andrews. Excellent series, uh, DigiBridge it's called, and there's a folder back there about those lectures that are going on. Uh, they're also available on YouTube afterwards, but the topics and the speakers are outstanding. Dan Turner's been coordinating that. And you are all the first to see our schedule for next year. We have the 2022-2023 schedule um, that is ready for Tuesday's Wiz, so you can get it on your calendar and take a look. We have two of our speakers right here. Lily Jean Johnson is going to be in October with a panel of the stores of Front Street Stories of Georgetown's Black Merchants. And Tim Chapman is right here. And in what month is that? April, a year from now, uh, Tim and Zenobi are going to do a presentation on raising a Gullah garden. So uh, just hope you'll join with us. And again, thank you so very much, Ben, for today. Appreciate it all. Thank you all very, very much.